I mix what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like. What's up, world? Welcome to another edition of I Mix What I Like right here in Black Power Media. Again, I'm Jared Ball. Very happy to be your host. Please, as always, like, share, and subscribe. Comment. Support our Patreon. All the links to that and more in the show description. 2024 is already shaping up to be a banner year for cinematic assaults on Black radical consciousness. We did a previous video about the forthcoming film on Bob Marley. Please check that out, link in the show description. And then someone sent me a little while ago the, the, this trailer for Geniuses, National Geographic's Genius series, which is going to pick up, again, the discussion and juxtaposition of Malcolm X against or related to Dr. King. Get your Vernon philosophies together and let's check the trailer. I don't think you can understand who Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was and his legacy without understanding the legacy of Malcolm X. It was very interesting to see them side by side, but in different places. They had the same objectives. They had the same goals. Their approach is just a little different. They're just reaching people that the other miss. There's a preconception they were both against each other. Over time, they really become people who influence the other. It's as though they're speaking to each other throughout history. We understand. We made it last. So already right there in the trailer, you see a couple of things. You see the similar framing that we've often gotten. King and Malcolm weren't that different, or King and Malcolm were thought to be different, but were they that, how different were they? What were their their similarities? They both wanted the same thing. They had the same goals. You see Peniel Joseph already in there as the key voice sort of narrating the trailer already, setting this tone for what appears to be this the the updating of the standard approach. King was nonviolent, Malcolm was violent. They both went through some changes. Usually that's described as King quote unquote sort of politically softening and moving to his right to adopt a more Kingian sort of politics. King is never credited or rarely credited or acknowledged with moving ever more to his left politically and if if showing that the the joining of forces that was developing between Malcolm and Martin was was evolving more on the basis of Malcolm's radical politics than anything else. But yet and still it is that juxtaposition of one against the other with what appears to be the attempt to tell us that to the extent that, as the counterintelligence program said of Dr. King, he adhered to white liberalism and nonviolence, he was acceptable. Similar to what we've already discussed in terms of Peniel Joseph's work around Stokely Carmichael, Kwame Ture, and Malcolm X, to the extent that they moved left of the Democratic Party, left of sort of mainstream civil rights consensus, they lost value, lost their way lost their relevance. With Joseph's involvement here, I will, uh, and happily be checked if I'm wrong, continue uh, um, to assume initially that that's the frame that's going to be brought here. That, In other words, that they are going to be juxtaposed against one another, and to the extent that one is or the other is redeemable, it will be on the basis of them moving ever to the right to a more liberal, I might call neoliberal politic, et cetera, and so forth. And in each case, the actual radical politics that Malcolm and Martin dealt with will not be centered, given just do, focused, uh, if if included or referenced even at all. All right, but if we look a little bit at this Variety article, uh, I think it gives a little bit more context to my own initial thoughts and gives us a little more information about what is... is uh, the attempt here. 
So Genius MLK X sets to premiere, uh, sets a premiere date. It's going to be in February, just in time for Black History Month, of course, with the first two episodes uh, appearing on February 1st. But as it says here, unlike past seasons, this season of Genius will tell the story of two geniuses. Civil rights movement leaders, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X. Rest in peace, Andre Brower. I just see that he passed, and I see that uh, I was actually a big fan of his, particularly uh, back in the day on Homicide, and his interrogation box scenes are classic uh, in in terms of good writing, I think, and good copaganda. It was well done copaganda, but uh, a big fan of his. Uh, and, of course, he did copaganda as well on Brooklyn Nine-Nine, but that contradiction notwithstanding, he did it very well. He was a brilliant actor, and I um, am sorry for his loss and peace to his family. But as Variety continues here, the official description of the season states that it will follow both King and X from their formative years, where they were molded by strong fathers and traumatic injustices to their rich parallel stories as they shaped their identities and became the change they wished to see in the world. Influenced as children by different upbringings and experiences, King by the Jim Crow era South and life in the church before finding his voice at Morehouse and Boston University, an ex growing up under constant deadly violence of the Klan and falling into a life of vice and incarceration where he was introduced to the Nation of Islam and found his voice. The two visionaries ultimately rose to pioneer a movement. You can see here some of the people featured in as as cast. Uh, I'm sure they're very talented and beautiful people. But what is of most interest to me is this part here where there's a discussion and description of the think tank of historians and experts who served as production consultants prior to the start of the writer's room to guide the production, including in alphabetical order, Jamal Joseph, who I did reach out to and invited to to discuss this and should he ever respond I'll let any I'll let you all know and maybe he'll join us here and if not here elsewhere and we'll happily check that out as well but of course my main concern is was seeing this we already heard his voice and saw him featured prominently in the trailer uh, I'm not at all surprised and have been predicting for going on almost almost two decades now that Joseph would become a permanent problem in reproducing a neoliberal narrative of black radical histories and individuals links to previous work on that. And even our debate uh, I'll put in the show description, you can check that out for yourselves, but I'm not surprised. And again, have even predicted he would be here. Uh, Barbara Reynolds, if folks want to go back, I'll make sure that's in the show description as well. She is discussed by my godfather, Mr. Tom Porter, in a very critical way uh, for for her versions of him and Jesse Jackson in her previous work. Uh, noted here, Jesse Jackson's America, America's David. And... I also would want to note Jeff Stetson because it, it says here that the meeting he that he he authored, of course, the the famous play going back several decades now, uh, the meeting between Dr. King and, and Malcolm X, a fictional depiction of them having a meeting. I did go back and watch it, a version of it at least on YouTube, um, and was reminded of what I've always thought it to be a very with all due respect, sophomoric introduction to the two men, and that does what I fear is being done in a new version in this forthcoming film. It just sort of sets up that that base, again, sophomoric juxtaposition of King versus Malcolm. And what if we had put our put down our 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 what if we had joined forces forces earlier and what what we could have done again no real discussion of their radical politics ever increasing particularly for dr king no discussion of the state no discussion of counter of the counterintelligence program no discussion of the assassinations no discussion of of all of the broader anti-colonial anti-capitalist radical politics that both men were increasingly involved with and and, and targeted and assassinated for so it's perfect that he would be uh, involved here, not only as having been the inspiration for the series, but having written the pilot for it and serving as executive producer. So I think these are 
warning signs as to what we can expect we're going to get from uh, this this forthcoming series. Now, also, as this Blavity article reminds us, this is a Disney product. Disney owns National Geographic, or I think 70-plus percent of it. It's airing on Hulu, which is a Disney product. Uh, so we should be reminded of this, and and we've discussed this previously of what, about what this means, and I'll even put the link in the show description where we talked about not only our, what, what this means in terms of these histories becoming Disney products, but that Disney and and what it means when Disney and Disney-like companies are actually the ones owning the likenesses uh, to these figures, like Malcolm X. I don't think it's Disney in particular that owns Malcolm's likeness, but that company is discussed in that video we did about a year or so ago, so I'll put that in the link description. The point being, these histories, these images, these likenesses, these these windows to our past are not controlled by us. They're not owned by us. They're not designed with a frame for us to access these histories and people for any act, for the purposes that those people themselves had. And for us to pick up the radical traditions that they represented and to advance them. That's not why they exist. They exist to do quite the opposite. That was, and again, is the point of the, the, the comical reference both to the Vernon philosophy of black media avoidance, to the penny trick, that, that of Peniel Joseph, that the the nominal reference to individuals and histories that have that are themselves radical and revolutionary, but are depicted in very neoliberal frames, so that when they are passed on to our youth, again, much like the fifth tenet of the counterintelligence program directed at black communities, dictates mandates in a way that will discourage black youth from becoming radical. And as the oppression of black people continues, there needs to be a constant assault on the consciousness of those communities, and in particular, the radical traditions that might inform revolutionary responses to that ongoing oppression. So just as we see here, now, I, I did mention, I, I, I think I mentioned it in, maybe it was in, a, in, a, in, a, in another instance or edit, but I thought that it would be interesting to do a series that focused on Betty and Coretta. If you're going to juxtapose people, it would be interesting to see if, if those two are, are would be the, the, actually given the, the due that they deserve as individuals and, and also representatives of broader is, histories and struggles. Uh, what would, it would be interesting to see them get uh, centered. But again, not here. <laughs> As much as I would like to see the lives of Betty Shabazz and Coretta Scott King depicted and given more attention, I don't want it to be in the context that their husbands are constantly posthumously abused. Uh, but according to Blavity, this series is going to bring their wives, Coretta Scott King and Betty Shabazz, who are often portrayed as peripheral frig figures to the forefront and shows them as formidable equals of the movement. And then it goes on to point out, as we saw in the trailer, that neither Malcolm nor Martin would be have, have become who they were without the other. So also, again, I want to just quickly bring up a point or two I made uh, or have been trying to make in, in for, for a number of years uh, and is discussed in this presentation that I put together some years ago and the one attempt at a Prezi I ever uh, uh, engaged. It was, it's not a very well done Prezi. The content is dope and accurate, of course, but the, the, the presentation is, 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 it is, it is what it is. But, but there's a couple uh, points from this that I wanted to make that are, are, uh, I think predictably coming up again in this, this, framing and and the way Malcolm and Martin are juxtaposed. Now, again, there is, I think, a, a, a valuable way it could be done. That is, the juxtaposition of Malcolm against Martin, the kinds of politics they represented, the paths to to their conclusions that they, that they took, et cetera, and so forth. I think there is value there. I think some of that work has been done well in the past. Uh, I was even thinking, uh, James Cone had a book, I think, uh, comparing the two of them and their religious approaches or something like that. Maybe we should get get a copy for Diallo. Uh, but 
but what is often done is is as I think is described in some of the research I found for this for this pre- pre- presentation some years ago that I think is still a value here. So I just wanted to bring renewed attention to it. First, just again to remind. Immediately after the March on Washington, William Sullivan, working on behalf of the FBI and J. Edgar Hoover, was already saying that we must mark Dr. King now if we have not done so before as the most dangerous Negro of the future of this nation from the standpoint of communism, the Negro, and national security. We've talked about this before repeatedly. This was also in the context of a fear that King's leadership would, would take black people towards an affinity for and defense of and solidarity with the Cuban Revolution. So even with this, this, the relatively soft and liberal I Have a Dream speech, Dr. King was already moving beyond mainstream civil rights, what was sanctionable by the state and mainstream civil rights, and it was noted already by the highest levels and the most vicious levels of the federal government. So what I've always just wanted to tr- quickly try to point out, and again, we can assess this and I'll predict that it's not going to appear uh in in this forthcoming series, but this is sort of the point that I've been trying to make as it relates to these two, and that we how we see them, what we see not considered when each are themselves considered individually, or certainly again in juxtaposition against the other, and that is just quickly in each case, Malcolm and, and Martin. Ex- they both express deep commitments to black unity and extending that unity to global anti-colonial and anti-imperial struggles. Both expressed a fealty to anti-capitalist ideas. Both expressed strong and particular criticism of the black bourgeoisie and white liberals. Both expressed zero confidence in legislation and conventional methods of protest politics. Again, both were advocating that we differently approach electoral politics, not simply voting for the lesser of evils or to stop one or another fascist, this, that, or the other. And then lastly, both express support for direct action campaigns. And I don't know to what extent, particularly that point will be made clear. I'm, I have zero confidence that point will be made clear in this series. If anything, they're going to try to make it seem like King, uh, that Malcolm was walking away from armed struggle and King t- towards a King uh, that was seen a- 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 as representing those politics. But even as the counterintelligence program documents stated themselves, they were concerned that if King left his adherence, his obedience for liberalism and nonviolent doctrines, he would become the number one threat to the state. But it was his direct action campaigns and advocacy calls that made him the threat and that are often ignored when King is himself considered. Malcolm never disavowed armed struggle, self defense, and even guerrilla warfare. So, we can be, I guarantee that will not be depicted correctly, if at all, in this series. But that is a point that that should often it should always be considered and remembered. Now, specifically, the argument of Powell and Amundsen is something I still think is is vitally important when we understand when we try to understand how King and and X both were politically in their lives, but how they're depicted posthumously. And as they wrote, the media created an image of Malcolm X as a violent, power-hungry extremist who was primarily interested in harming the white population in the United States. And that's why Wendy Wolf, the Viking Press publisher and editor for Manning Marable's A, 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 a Life of Reinvention, expressed that fear of Malcolm and what he represented to her community of white liberals. <laughs> Contrasting Malcolm X with Martin Luther King Jr. in the media fostered this negative image. The two men were described as opposite ends of a spectrum. King is adv- advocating nonviolence. X is advocating violence. King is a black minister. X is an ex-convict. King is a civil rights leader. X is a ra- racial fanatic. And I'm sure to whatever extent that 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 Genius and Disney tried to adjust this frame, it will be to show that K- Malcolm was much more like King than than we would want and much more like the King they would want us to think King was than the King that actually was. 
Similarly, they wrote, Black Muslims and thus Malcolm X were characterized as extremists within the media. The media created this image with the terms used to describe Malcolm X and Black Muslims, anti-Christian, anti-white, alienation, agitators, Black supremacy, bitter, confrontation, cult, enemy, extremist, exploit, hate, militant, separation, sect, threat, and trouble. These terms appeared frequently and with high intensity, shaping a negative image of Malcolm X in the media. The New York Times, in particular, constructed oppositional identities of the two leaders. Malcolm X was framed as a doppelganger to King. They were portrayed as opposite men with opposite goals. And I'm not going to belabor the point here, but I did just want to quickly show again the article, the, the story that came out from early this year that we covered in our discussion of with Dr. Burroughs of Jonathan Eag's new book on Dr. King and all of its flaws. Eag was pointing out the the I don't know revelation that if it, if it, if it was to some that uh, the quote that is often or had been often attributed to Dr. King condemning the work of Malcolm X was itself false wasn't wasn't reported accurately uh, it wasn't true and my point in bringing it up here is that that is only to say that there have always been and has has in addition to the media. Uh, description I just covered a moment ago, there has always been an effort to distort the relationship between King and X and to distort each of them individually in and post their lives. So to see Genius and Disney coming back again to do their version of this or to update that constant juxtaposition and false representation of each and false comparisons to each and false dichotomies created for each through each. Just as a quick reminder, there's a history and a legacy of this of this being an issue. Just a, a quick warning, yet another warning for, again, 2024 is looking bad. As Daruba says, it's looking bad for the home team as it comes to, as it pertains to the depiction of uh, these histories and individuals and the politics uh, that they that they uh, dealt with and advocated. So we have to stay vigilant on our Vernon philosophy. And again, remember, Vernon philosophy isn't calling for a, a material boycott. It is an intellectual boycott. It is saying, I know many of us are going to engage these media products, our, our people, our students, our families are going to engage these media products. And I do think we have to be able to offer up uh, an analysis and a critique, but also to have some, some, some prophylactic protection of sorts, intellectual prophylactic protection, self-defensive fitness, again, as Chuck D in Public Enemy once said, in, 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 in being, rem being reminded of what the Vernon philosophy holds as its core tenet that oppressed people, colonized people, black people in particular here in the United States, cannot, should not look to see themselves or accurate depictions of themselves in mainstream commercial media. All that is popular is fraudulent. All that is popular is a false claim and representation, or worse, is, an, is a conscious attempt at psychological warfare against the people in the subjects it claims to represent. All right, everybody, see you next time here at I Mix What I Like. Thanks again. Please like, share, subscribe, join the platform, support our Patreon if at all possible. Links are in the show description, in, in, including to all the work and more that was referenced here. As Fred Hampton used to say, peace only if you're willing to fight for it. Catch you next time here at I Mix What I Like. Thanks again, everybody.